Here we go, back to the book of Acts. Open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Look at the first of a two-part message, and the opening portion being verses 12 through 25, as the whole of the scene ranges through the end of the chapter in verse 42. Now, as we launch into our text today, I think it's important for us to be reminded that we are not looking at and studying what the church used to be. The church today is the same church that was born on Pentecost. The church of the first century is the same church of the 21st century, and we can say that with full assurance because of one thing. In Colossians 1, 15 to 18, we're told, he, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn, that's a position of authority, it doesn't mean born first, it means one in charge, even an heir, heir, H-E-I-R, not E-R-R-O-R. -R -R. <coughs> he is the authority over all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven <coughs> and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence or first place. Listen, the head of the church hasn't changed. And therefore, the mission of the church hasn't changed. The destiny of the church hasn't changed. So the function within the church hasn't changed either. Now in Acts chapter 2, 38 to 39, Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They posed a question that about men dwelling in Jerusalem. What do we do now? And Peter said, Repent, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Now that implies that God is going to operate in the same manner in every sin. He is going to fill his children with his spirit when they repent of their sin. Somebody say, Amen. Now, we also know that Jesus warned of false Christ in the last days. Paul warned of defections from the truth in the last days. And even the intolerance of teaching sound doctrine. But we need to remember that false Christs and doctrines are not part of the true church. And those who preach and promote themselves, they may call themselves a church, but the church is today what it has always been. It is the body of Christ of which he is the head. Now, as we reconnect with Peter and the apostles, remember, Satan has already launched out into his effort to persecute the church. Yet even as he persecutes the church, souls are added to God's kingdom by the thousands. So he employed a second tactic in seeking to infiltrate the church with hypocrisy through the lying of Ananias and Sapphira to the Holy Spirit, which obviously cost them dearly. Now, we'll find the last of our triad of, of satanic tactics to destroy the church when we arrive in chapter 6, as he seeks to distract the church in an effort to derail the apostles from their main calling, which is preaching the gospel. Now, our verses today do record the escalation of persecution at the hands of the council to whom Peter had preached the resurrection of Christ from the dead. But what we're also going to see via our title is something else that has not and cannot ever change, and that is, and here's our title this morning, The Power of the Gospel. Our title this morning is The Power of the Gospel. Has the gospel lost any steam through the centuries? No, it certainly has not. The head of the church remains the same. The Holy Spirit remains the same. The Father remains the same. The church remains the same. Now, I'm all for using every form of technology to communicate the gospel, but we have to remember, even in this age of technology, the power is in our message, not our method. And it was just and powerful when preached without a microphone. Billy Sunday is said to have preached to 200 million people and hundreds of thousands coming to Christ, and he did so without a microphone. And news, he would preach to crowds of 16 to 20,000 eight and nine times a day. 
and people would come forward and receive Christ at every opportunity. Now listen, lights and amplified music are great, but they do not enhance the power of the gospel one bit. The gospel doesn't need human help. The gospel does not need technological advances to be effective. It only needs a human vessel who is willing to proclaim it. Case in point, a nearly 300-year-old sermon is often touted as the most famous sermon of all time of those in the Bible. And it was reportedly delivered by a man who did so in a very nasally and mild manner as he read his scripture and sermon. People reacted, history tells us, as they wailed in anguish seeking repentance. It is said that grown men have also says that there were lots of fingernail marks in the back of the wooden pews that were dug in when people heard Jonathan Edwards preach of sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now the point is this. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Is my mic going on and off? Okay, so it's not just me. All right, I feel better this morning. Let me see if I can't re-situate it. Let's try this. All right. Now, also that tells us that the apostles that predated Paul weren't ashamed of the gospel either. And as we have and will see in our text this morning, this will be proven to be so. They believed in the power of the message itself and not the method or the messenger. Remember, Peter had preached it to the devout men dwelling in Jerusalem. He preached it to the crowds at Solomon's porch gathered after the healing of the man lame from birth. He preached it then to the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the captain of the temple guard, the high priest and his family, and the content of the message remained almost the, uh, verbatim the same. Now in Acts 4, 8 to 12, Peter preached filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, the lame man who was healed, by what means he has been made well, let it be made known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And sadly, saints, I have to say today that much of the methodology that is incorporated into the church today is a lack of confidence in the power of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is able to save men's souls. And God doesn't need laser lights or concert settings in order to do so. Jonathan Edwards read his message in a monotone voice, and the end result was America experienced a great awakening. Why? Because the power is in the gospel, not the method nor the messenger. Amen? Now, let me add this again. We should post, tweet, Instagram, YouTube, audio, video, broadcast the gospel in every possible medium that we can. It's still the gospel itself that has the power to save. So let's catch up with Peter and company and glean some reminders of this great truth. Would you stand and read with me, please? Acts chapter 5. We'll pick it up in verse 12, reading down to verse 25. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were 
spirits, and they were who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and all the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, bingo, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the, of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And Lord, we thank you for this beautiful text and these reminders of the authority and power of your word, your gospel. And Lord, I pray that you would enlighten our eyes of understanding to this truth more than ever before through our time together today. And Lord, would you also increase our boldness to be like these we are reading at the church at its birth and in infancy, to simply have a faith and trust in the message we've been given to change the world around us. Teach us that, we pray today in Jesus' name. And please fix this mic. And all God's people said in agreement, amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, it is in verses 12 to 16 where we'll find the first of our three observations concerning the power of the gospel, and we'll address a couple of doctrinal issues as well. Now, the first would be this. There are those who say that signs and wonders were limited to the apostles only or the apostolic age only. Now, I have to say that I have personally seen too many things contrary to that to believe that it's true. We do, however, need to note that at this point, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit's power in the form of signs and wonders does seem to be limited to them, but this would be understandable. These men had walked with Jesus and heard him teach for three years. Everyone else had only heard of him and only walked with him for weeks or possibly months. And we also see that some, we're told, did not dare to join them. And I think that probably attached a little bit to what they saw happen with Ananias and Sapphira. And yet believers were increasingly added to the Lord. The distinction is made by those who simply looked at and admired people who followed Christ versus those who were actually believers and submitted their lives to the Lord. Now we also see that superstition had already crept into the church concerning signs and wonders. As some thought that if Peter's shadow just fell on them, they would be healed. Now this was not unlike the belief concerning the pool of Bethesda. In John 5, 1 to 4, we're told of, of a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in, Beth in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick, peop sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, remember, the Bible often records what it is that people believe, but it doesn't mean that it was actually so. Now, I want you to think about this scene here, especially at the pool of Bethesda. Can you imagine our great God who loves all sitting on high saying to an angel, you go down and stir up the waters at the pool of Bethesda and we'll see which one of the lame and sick people get there first and the winner gets a healing. Does that sound like our God? No, of course not. Now, this is what the people believed. And in neither case, the shadow of Peter nor the stirring water at Bethesda uh, shows any evidence that it was actually true or happened. However, we are told those who came to Jerusalem and brought their sick and possessed to the apostles, they were healed. Now, as I said, I don't believe that healing or signs and wonders are limited to the apostles or the apostolic age. But I do believe that was the case initially to keep the church on track and away from superstitions or the abuse of the gifts of the Spirit. 
Now, we also need to know from our section that signs and wonders don't always lead to converts. Some esteemed the apostles highly, but they didn't join them. Others believed and were added to their number. The high priests and the Sadducees, we'll find out, were indignant about the signs and wonders and the preaching of the apostles. Now, we always need to keep in mind that God is more interested in the healing of the eternal soul than he is the healing of a temporal body. A healed body is eventually going to die. Everybody that Jesus healed their physical body, they did later die. But everybody who followed him by faith had a healed soul and they will live with him forever. Verse 25, hey, that was an awesome amen. Verse 25 reminds us that what the group opposed most of all was the teaching of the apostles and when they stand before them again, Peter preaches the resurrected Christ to them again or he preaches the gospel. Now that reminds us, uh, gives us our reminder of the power of the unchanging gospel and therefore the unchanged church as our first point. Now listen, this is a bit long, but I think you'll find it to be true. Listen, there are no racial, material, or physical boundaries where the power of the gospel cannot prevail. There are no racial, material, or physical boundaries where the power of the gospel cannot prevail. Now, what that means is this. People don't need their financial status to change before coming to know Christ. They don't need their physical condition to change before coming to know Christ. They don't need social or racial injustices or tensions resolved in order to come to Christ. Listen, they don't even need all the hypocrites to be put out of the church before coming to Christ. What people need is to hear the gospel of Christ and be saved. Now in Matthew 11, 2 to 5, I've got a string of uh, sets of verses here for you. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have what? The gospel preached to them. Romans 15, 14 and 16, Paul says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, also are able to admonish one another, able also to admonish one another, nevertheless, brethren. I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by who? God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to who? The Gentiles, non-Jews, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now then in Revelation 14 and 6, we're told, John said, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting what? Gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Now this again makes our point. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now listen this morning. We do not have to explain why God allows suffering, sickness, or physical handicaps. We just need to preach the gospel. We don't have to justify God's right to judge people who reject him. We just need to preach the gospel. We don't need to apologize for abuses in the church in an effort to legitimize the church. We just need to, there's a pattern developing, preach the gospel. We don't need to customize the gospel to suit the poor or any racial group. We just need to preach the gospel because the truth is some will not dare join us but esteem the work of the church some will become believers and others will be indignant but no one say no one no one will be saved without having heard the gospel of Jesus Christ there are no racial material or physical boundaries where the power of the gospel cannot prevail because the gospel is Jesus crucified and glorified for the sins of the whole world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's take a second read through 17 to 21. 
Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Well, surprise, surprise for them. Now, the real issue, I think, in this particular section is revealed in the word indignation. It's the word zealous, which obviously is our English word, uh, or translated into our English word zealous. It can also mean jealousy. It can be rightfully translated as envy which reminds us of the words of James in 3, 14 to 18, where James says, if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Now listen close. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first what? Pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without... Yes, that's in there, hypocrisy. Now, consider the test group in front of us, and we can see that this is true. They're filled with jealousy and envy, and earthly and demonic actions are going to follow because the apostles were gathering a huge following, and the envious high priest and Sadducees laid hands on them and threw them into the common prison, meaning the general population of criminals. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and told them, go stand in the temple and speak. And that word speak can also be translated into the word preach. To the people, all the words of this life. Now, Romans 6, 4, we're reminded, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in what? Newness of life. We often hear quoted in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a beautiful promise to those who come to believe. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have what? Passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, the newness of life that results from coming Uh, Becoming a new creation is the life the angel told them to preach to the people about. And this life only happens through being born again. Now, let's also consider again the apostolic response, and this was the group of them, including uh, Matthias, who was uh, selected by them. The 12 of them are thrown into prison and then supernaturally released. We need to take note. They didn't go home and debrief. They didn't go home and regroup. They didn't go home and lick their wounds or collect their thoughts after being arrested. Early in the morning, they entered the temple and taught all the people about this new life. Now, I also find it worth mentioning that when the high priest rose up, an angel of the Lord came down. Now, that gives us our next unchanging truth about the power of the gospel in the church today, and it's simply this. Listen this morning. Proclaiming the gospel instantly connects us to supernatural power and experiences. Proclaiming the gospel instantly connects us to supernatural power and experiences. Think about how the church was born and the first promise that it received. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be what? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now that makes the preaching and supernatural power connection for us, reminding us that Jesus said, without me, you can do what? Nothing. He is the core of the gospel message. And when we're preaching according to the word of God or preaching and rightly dividing the word of truth, it's going to require and therefore encounter Holy Spirit power. Now, I can't even tell you how many times I've been in an an exchange with someone or sharing the gospel with them or discussing something, uh, biblical precept or doctrine, when I said to someone something that I didn't even know I knew 
or shared a verse that I didn't even know I remembered. One time the Lord impressed on me to read Acts 16 and the story, story of a slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination that Paul became annoyed with and rebuked the girl. And I just, the Lord impressed on me to read that, and I read it and studied it carefully, and the next day, I needed it. I had a supernatural encounter. And God will always, listen, God will always participate in the faithful preaching of his word. And thus, supernatural encounters, like the apostle had here, should not, the apostles had here, should not be unexpected. Now remember, this wasn't the norm. The apostles were arrested at other times, Paul included, and he did not get released. But the supernatural occurred nonetheless, even if it was simply the anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach to others who were imprisoned. Or as Paul, for two years, preached to Roman guards chained to him by 18-inch chains on either hand. Now, breaking this down to street level, let me just say this to us all this morning. If you're sensing a lack of spiritual power in your life, go tell somebody about Jesus and the power drought will come to an end. Just go tell somebody about Jesus and he will empower you to do so. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 to 5, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in what? Demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now listen, I'm sure I can say this for most of us here. I don't want to be a go-through-the-motions kind of Christian. I don't want to be a Christian just in name only. I want to live a life that is filled with supernatural power and experiences. And the truth is, anytime anyone wants to experience God's power, all you have to do is preach the gospel. And you will have supernatural power and supernatural experiences that go along with preaching the gospel. Now, it may not be an angelic release from prison, well, that would be cool. But you have to go to prison first. That's uncool. Maybe it'll be a word of knowledge. Maybe it will be discernment. Maybe it will be, as I said earlier, sharing verses you didn't even know you knew. Maybe it will be boldness that is outside of the norm for you. But one thing is for sure, when you seek to obey God and preach the gospel, you will never lack for supernatural power or experiences. Amen? Now, let's look and see how blessed and impressed the council was that the boys were back preaching the next day. Pick it up in 22, and we'll read down to 25 again. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely, and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the, of the temple, and the priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple, and what are they doing? What did the angel tell them to do? Teach the people. Now, time will not allow us to continue in these incredible verses. As I said, uh, this is the first of a two-part uh, mini-series, so to speak. So it's kind of like the season finale of a TV series that leaves you hanging, wondering what the outcome will be, just as we see in our verses. Now, we're going to have to wait till next week to find out, but for now, consider the magnitude of what we just read. A fully staffed prison with gates, locks, guards, has no idea that those inside that they locked up the day before are now gone. And there's seemingly no evidence of a prison break. Now, the text says that the doors were open, and we don't know if they simply walked by the guards and says, these are not the men you're looking for, like <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi. We, I don't know if exactly what happened, but however the Lord did it, no one at the prison knew it happened, but it didn't take long to find out where they'd escaped to. One came and told the council, and the officers, the men you put in prison, are standing in the temple teaching the people. Now remember back in verse 31 of chapter 4, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were, next word, all filled 
with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, it's obvious these men continued in that boldness because they continued in the Spirit. And we don't want to overlook or minimize the connection between the Holy Spirit and boldness and power. We need to walk in the Spirit in order to be bold for the Lord. Now, our last consideration of the power of the gospel is a reminder to us all of both the power and the importance of our message, but also the commitment of God to those who proclaim it. Now listen, here's the last thing I want you to consider as you get ready to go to the world and preach the gospel today and every day from this day forward. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Listen, no man, demon, or devil can thwart the power of the gospel. No man, demon, or devil can thwart the power of the gospel. You know how we know this is so? Because you can preach it in the prison and you can preach it in the palace. You can preach it to the poor. You can preach it to the affluent. You can preach it to the sick. You can preach it to the well. You can preach it anywhere under any circumstances and neither man, demons, nor the devil can stop its transformative and soul-saving power. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25, Paul would say the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater or disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Yes, he has. For since in the wisdom of God... The world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God, not that he has any, is wiser than men and the weakness of God, not that he has any, is stronger than men. Yes, the power of the gospel cannot even be thwarted by rocket man in North Korea. There are Christians there too, even though they're either imprisoned or killed for their faith. You know, I ran across a video that I'd seen many times, uh, or several times, I should say, in the past. And I found it interesting and a, a reminder to us here this morning. Many of you have probably seen it. It's a story of back in 1995 where there were 14 wolves that were reintroduced into the ecosystem of Yellowstone National Park. Within a decade of introducing 14 wolves, the deer population had both been thinned and driven deeper into the woods. And as a result, the riverbanks within Yellowstone began to flourish with aspen and willow trees, and much of the bushes and berries that used to grow along the banks began to grow again. The trees brought back bird species. The trees brought back beavers to the park who had become extinct in that area. They built dams, which created pools. This attracted otters muskrats, other reptiles. The wolves also killed coyotes, allowing the rabbit and mouse population to boom, which brought back foxes and weasels, as well as hawks and eagles to the park. The dams built by the beavers caused the riverbanks to flourish with plants and trees, which slowed erosion, and the rivers were stabilized within their course. And within 20 years of introducing 14 wolves into Yellowstone, the whole park was changed for the better. Now the point is simply this. We may be hunted like prey by a roaring lion, but persecution has always caused the church to flourish. It has never caused the church to perish. And since the church is the same as it was in Peter and Paul's day, it's true for us here today. In Matthew 16, 13 to 19, we're told of when Jesus came to the region of uh, Caesarea Philippi, is how it be pronounced, we call it Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, 
Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, uh, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We could spend a morning just talking about these last few sentences. But the fact is, the Lord says to Peter, on this rock, and there's been all kinds of interpretive gymnastics over this, the Lord is just telling Peter, the first sermon preached that begins the church age is going to be preached by you. And he did. And 3,000 souls were added to the church through that first sermon. Amen? We're also told, and this is kind of a bonus point, to all the church, it is told, whatever you bind in heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. These are legal terms. That means that if you agree that someone or something is bound in the sense of an obligation or judgment, then they are bound to it. If they are freed from it, a dispute between friends or uh, whatever it may be, then they're freed from it. Heaven is in agreement. Listen, it has nothing to do with binding Satan or demons. Somebody say amen. That was a really weak amen. That's a little better. Now, the point for us is not binding and loosing Satan. I don't know why anybody would want to loose them if they could bind him. But the point is that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church even when spiritual predators are introduced into our environment. The power of the gospel cannot be thwarted and the church will still thrive. If Jesus says the gates of Hades will not prevail against his church, then the gates of Hades will not prevail against his church ever, including today. After all, in Romans 8.31, Paul writes, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 adds, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What's the last sentence? What can man do to me? Now listen this morning in conclusion. The decision of the President of the United States to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is going to have continuing repercussions, even beyond those that it already has. But like I told the group on Wednesday night, God had already established the fact that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. He's already said that's where his son is going to reign from when he returns and rules the nations with a rod of iron for a thousand years and we come back with him. Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the nation of Israel. Amen. However, this statement has revealed a polarized world just as Zechariah prophesied. Anti-Semitism is rising because of this statement. And one sovereign nation has the right to declare their own capital. It's true for every other country in the world. Why wouldn't it be true for Israel? And why would people be all up in arms because the president of one country acknowledged something that another country's prime minister and its country has long stated, that Jerusalem is the capital city of the nation of Israel. Now, what that tells us is that potentially we have a catalyst for the Ezekiel War and these nations that are already in alignment with one another, the coalition forces led by Russia, followed by uh, the Persians or the Iranians, North African nations and the southern nations of Russia, they're already in alliance with one another. They're already on the northern border of Israel, many of them at least. Russia's already there building bases in Syria. And these nations will be led down from the north, according to Ezekiel's prophecy. And they will invade Israel. And this is indeed consistent with what we're told in Zechariah about Jerusalem being a burdensome stone to all peoples. The whole world is going to be gathered 
against Jerusalem in the last days. And Zechariah 14 says, the nations that gather to fight against Jerusalem, God will fight against them as he fights. And when God fights, he wins. He's never even had a close call. Now, listen this morning. I say this for this reason. We need to be spiritually fit. We need to have our eyes open at such a time as this. We need to be bold in our proclamations of the gospel, no matter cost or consequence. Because Jesus is coming. And Paul prophesied, as did Jesus, that in the last days, things would become increasingly perilous. Jesus said they'd be like they were in the days of Noah. We know of Noah's day. The times were exceedingly violent. People did. Uh, the thoughts and intents of people's hearts were only evil continually. Paul said perilous times will come. But listen. Listen. No man, demon, or devil can thwart the power of the gospel. And we need to keep preaching Christ because it will prevail in the hearts and minds of some, even in a time when sound doctrine is not endured and fables are preferred by those who call themselves Christian. Listen, the gospel will prevail when it's outlawed. The gospel will prevail when it's banned. The gospel will prevail when it's disparaged. The gospel will prevail when it's belittled. And the fact is, you just can't stop or hinder the power of the gospel. So when man rises up against the church, divine power comes down on the church, and it will not be prevailed against. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for these great exceedingly great and precious promises. We thank you, Lord, that we know today that the head of the church remains the same. Death couldn't hold your son. It had no right to him. And early in the morning on the first day of the week, up from the grave he arose as prophesied. We thank you, Lord, that this gave opportunity for Jew and Gentile alike to become believers in the resurrected Lord and have their own lives changed dramatically and to become bold proclaimers of the life that they now live, a life of having been set free and made free indeed. So Lord, help us in times such as these, especially at this time of year, God, as we find ourselves in the book of Acts studying what the church is to be like in every era of history. People today, Lord, or some are saying Merry Christmas, so the title of your son, Christ, is on the minds and hearts of many. Help us to take advantage of the moment and be bold in proclaiming Christ and him crucified. And Lord, we thank you for these things that we have uncovered this morning. Thank you for the boldness of the 12. Thank you, Lord, that we see even after they've been thrown in the prison, the common prison, but the general population. Lord, that having been told by an angel to go and teach of this life, the next morning, early in the morning, they were at it again. Help us to take from that, God, that even when we've been rejected or insulted, to keep preaching Christ and him crucified. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study these things, and we ask that you would bless us now as we go and do them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's warriors said, Amen. It is an exciting time to be alive. To watch all these things going on in the world. And I love what Dr. Ed Heinsohn says. He says, prophecy isn't meant to scare us, it's meant to prepare us. And therefore, we ought to be prepared for the shortness of the hour. Someone had asked me uh, a couple of weeks ago, what between 1 and 10 was my expectancy of the Lord's return in my lifetime? I said, 10 absolutely 10. I hope he comes today. I want to live with an expectancy that creates an urgency to tell people about Jesus. And I hope that's true for all of us, because I know you believe he's coming soon. He said he would. He said he's gone to prepare a place for us, that when he comes again, he'll receive us unto himself, that we may be uh, with him and be with him always. That's a pretty exciting thing to consider. 
Getting left is not quite so exciting. And there's only one way that those that we know and care for, and those even that we don't know, and maybe even don't care for, can come into a personal relationship with Christ, and it's the preaching of the gospel. And we've all been commissioned to do so. So be bold this week. Hello? Be bold this week. Step outside your comfort zone. Well, better yet, just get rid of your comfort zone. Just do things for God's glory. And you know what? Even if you're terrified, he's going to be with you. Even if you felt like, you know, that's just not my thing. I'm just not the street evangelist. I just can't walk up to a stranger and tell them about Jesus. I got good news. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Absolutely. You can do all things through Christ who does what? strengthens you, including what you're afraid to do. Now listen, we're not all like some of these people that we meet that just as soon as they're in a conversation with anybody, all of a sudden they turn it to the Lord. We're not all like that. Not everybody has that street evangelist gift, but everybody does have the evangelism commission. So be bold this week. Step outside the box. Tell somebody about Jesus. Initiate the conversation. Invite somebody to church. Not and leaving, uh, not leaving it there, but using that as a way to open the door to share the gospel.